Today we will be journeying into the biochemical region of irreducible complexities, a strong pushback against the theory of Darwinian evolution that they teach in our schools today. If you would like to learn this sort of Christian information in a fun way, check out our board game in the description section below, or go to welcometotruth.com for more Christian education and apologetics. Today we will be covering irreducible complexities, a term coined by Dr. Michael Behe in his epic book, Darwin's Black Box. So what are irreducible complexities and how do they disprove evolution? I'm so glad you asked. The evolution that we learn about in our schools today is about a gradual process. Charles Darwin, the father of evolution, had to convince the public that complex organs could be formed in a step-by-step process of natural selection. Anything greater than that would be similar to a miracle. Darwin said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed which could not have possibly been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. Remember, according to traditional evolution, organisms only evolve in a step-by-step manner, and each step of the way must provide a functional advantage to that organism. Dr. B, he compares irreducible complexities to a mousetrap. The function of a mousetrap is, of course, to immobilize a mouse. A traditional mousetrap might consist of five different parts. A flat wooden platform to act as the base is one part. Then there is a metal hammer, which does the actual job of crushing the little mouse. Third is a spring with extended ends to press against the platform and the hammer when the trap is charged. Fourth is a sensitive catch that releases when slight pressure is applied. And fifth is a metal bar that connects to the catch and holds the hammer back when the trap is charged. So what's the point? Well, the point of the concept of gradualism in evolution is that each step along the evolutionary curve must prove to be functional. So not only does the whole system prove to be functional, but each part, that's all the system components must be functional and must have evolved to still be here based on that functional advantage. So all the components of the system are required for that system to function properly for the system to be considered irreducibly complex. In the example of the mousetrap, every part is needed in order for the mousetrap to function properly. As Dr. Behe states, which part could be missing and still allow you to catch a mouse? If the wooden base were gone, there would be no platform for attaching the other components. If the hammer were gone, the mouse could dance all night on the platform without becoming pinned to the wooden base. If there were no spring, the hammer and platform would jangle loosely and again the rodent would be unharmed. If there were no catch or metal holding bar, then the spring would snap the hammer shut as soon as you let go of it. If this was the case, you would have to chase the mouse around while holding the trap open. Behe concludes that for a system to be irreducibly complex, it would have no functional precursors. Remember, Darwinian evolution must show each step of the way how one thing evolved into another thing. And each step of the way must also confer a functional advantage in order to evolve. A lot of evolutionists like to gloss over the details of each of these steps, For instance, they may look at the current trends and construct an evolution of transportation for people and say, well, yeah, isn't it obvious? I mean, skateboard, toy wagon, bicycle, motorcycle, automobile, airplane, jet plane, space shuttle. It seems like a conceptual, natural progression, but you would have to show in each step how one somehow evolved into another, which obviously it didn't. In order to be a candidate for natural selection, a system must have minimal function. So, as Behe states, you are dealing not just with the five components that make a mousetrap what it is, but also the exact sizes of each component that make it the perfect candidate to be an effective mousetrap. 
For instance, if the base were made out of paper, the trap would fall apart. Uh, if the hammer were too heavy, it would break the spring. If the spring were too loose, it would not move the hammer. If the holding bar were too short, it would not reach the catch. And if the catch were too large, it would not release at the proper time. So a simple list of components of a mousetrap is necessary, but not sufficient to make a functioning mousetrap. Okay, now that we are a bit familiar with the concept of irreducible complexities, let me give you an example that Dr. Behe notes in his book. Let's talk about the bombardier beetle. This is an insect of unassuming appearance, measuring about one half inch in length. When it is threatened by another bug, however, the beetle has a special method of defending itself, squirting a boiling hot substance at the enemy out of an aperture in its hind section. It turns out the bombardier beetle is actually using chemistry. Prior to the battle, specialized structures called secretory lobes make a very concentrated mixture of two chemicals, hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone. The hydrogen peroxide is the same material as one you buy from a drugstore. Hydroquinone is used in photographic development. The mixture is sent into a storage chamber called a collecting vesicle. Now the collecting vesicle is connected to, but ordinarily sealed off from, a second compartment called the explosion chamber. The two compartments are kept separate from one another by a duct with a sphincter muscle, much like the sphincter muscles upon which humans depend on for, well, going to the bathroom at certain times and not at all other times. Attached to the explosion chamber are a number of small knobs called ectodermal glands. These secrete enzyme catalysts into the explosion chamber. When the beetle feels threatened, it squeezes muscles surrounding the storage chamber while simultaneously relaxing the sphincter muscle. This forces the solution of hydrogen peroxide and hydroquinone to enter the explosion chamber where it mixes with the enzyme catalyst and BOOM! Dr. Behe describes what's happening chemically speaking in the beetle. The hydrogen peroxide rapidly decomposes into ordinary water and oxygen, just as a store-bought bottle of hydrogen peroxide will decompose over time if left open. The oxygen reacts with the hydroquinone to yield more water, plus a highly irritating chemical called quinone. Those reactions require a large quantity of heat. The temperature of the solution rises to the boiling point. In fact, a portion vaporizes into steam. The steam and oxygen gas exert a great deal of pressure on the walls of the explosion chamber. With the sphincter muscle now closed, a channel leading outward from the beetle's body provides the only exit point for the boiling mixture. The collecting vesicle, the sphincter muscle, the explosion chamber, and the exit port are all complex structures in their own right with many unidentified components. But what causes a collecting vesicle to develop? What causes hydrogen peroxide to be excreted or a sphincter muscle to wrap around? And how did all of this come about? By chance? I doubt it. Check out this other video on how evolution fails to build even a single protein. Hey guys, these videos take hours and hours to make. Boost my energy up by buying me a coffee in the description section of this video. Thanks so much. And if you want to make educational videos like this, check out the Pictory link below in the description section. We'll see you in that video over there.